So for the past number of nights, we've been taking up words found in the gospel message, words found in your New Testament, and sometimes found in the Old Testament of the Bible. And we've spoken on those words, and a lot of times they've been opposites, and we've shown how in Jesus Christ these words are united. Tonight, our two words are the words mercy and grace. And these words don't need a lot of help to be united. They're really just the opposite sides of a coin. But mercy, uh, which is not getting what we deserve, not getting what we deserve, often referred to just this holding back of punishment. And grace, getting what we don't deserve, just the opposite. Something that we don't get, something that we do get. And this whole idea of what we deserve and what we don't will be spoken on tonight in these two words. It's my uh, responsibility to speak on this word mercy. And I want to do that. And I, we have a great verse to share with you tonight. If you have a Bible, it's found in the book of Titus, Titus chapter 3 and verse 5. Really, sometimes uh, we've been going through these words and you search for a verse that could just encapsulate what you want to speak on. And Sometimes it's just crystal clear, and other times you think it's going to take a lot of explaining. But here is a great verse found in Titus 3 and verse 5 that is so crystal clear um, when it comes to this term mercy and who provides it. So we're going to read this verse. If you want to read along with me, Titus 3 and verse 5 says this, Not by works of righteousness which we have done, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. Just going to read the first part of that verse. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, that's God, he saved us. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. When I hear that term mercy, I think sometimes you 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 like to have a maybe a personal experience that you can you can maybe illustrate a word with. Well, I think of mercy and my mind goes first and foremost way back to the sixth grade. And I was on a little league baseball team and it would have been uh, this this past uh, springtime that we would have been playing games. And I was in the sixth grade and. I remember I belonged to this baseball team and it was sponsored by the local pest control company, but they were too cheap to buy the full title on the jersey. So we were just called Horizon Pest. They left off the word control and it was embarrassing enough to be part of that team. But even worse than that was that our team wasn't too good. And uh, you could tell right away when you were in Little League Baseball, just by the color you got and who sponsored you, how good you were going to be. And we were awful. And I can remember one game, especially, I used to play in left field, and that was by my own choice. But I remember at a certain point, we were down 16 to nothing, and it was against the team that, that had cool jerseys. I think the color of it was black, and they were sponsored by a local diner in town. But at 16 to nothing, I remember the referee stopping the game, and he employed what he called the mercy rule. The mercy rule. And at that point, we were glad just because at the end of the game, you got to get ice cream. But Mercy was extended. Why? Because we were getting a lashing, just a beating. And someone had to stop it for the sake of parents who were embarrassed and kids who just wanted to go home. But mercy was shown by an umpire and said, enough is enough. Just stop punishing these kids. Call it quits. It's over. And I always remember that as my great example of mercy. This mercy is so much different. It's so much different. And you'll recognize that as we go through this verse. Why is it different? Well, just for this reason, when you read this verse, take note of this. It says it's his mercy, his mercy. This past week, I had to go through some things that were in a vehicle of my grandfather's, and he doesn't drive the vehicle anymore. And, and some of the things in this folder were just things you would automatically throw in the garbage. But I kept everything. Why? Because they were his. They were someone I knew. It was my grandfather's. If, if it was a a keychain, or if it was a piece of paper, I kept it because of who it belonged to. It had significance. Mercy might just be a term that you would just quickly forget and quickly lose sight of, but don't forget tonight, it's his mercy. It's the God of heaven's mercy. It's the mercy extended through Jesus Christ, and each night we've tried to show that. We've talked about 
his grace through 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Grace that comes from anybody else may could you could just brush to the side. But the grace of Jesus Christ, take notice of it. Something you could have tonight that you don't deserve. We talked about the love of God in Romans 5 and verse 8. God commended his love. It's not just the love of anybody on earth. It's God's love. Romans 5 tells us it's the death of his son, not just anybody's son, but God's son. And tonight, it's his mercy. If ever you were going to value something, you would value it by who it is from. Tonight, it's his mercy, God's mercy. It's extended to us. And our scripture says his mercy. It's two sides of a coin, mercy and grace. And to talk about mercy tonight, so significant because we can learn so much about just seeing God's mercy, because God is a merciful God. We know that if you had read through your Bible from Genesis until the end of the Old Testament, you would have read through those 39 books, and you would have said, God is merciful. You could have almost guaranteed it from the Old Testament. But it's not until the New Testament that you realize, how is he able to show mercy? It's because of his son, Jesus Christ. We're going to discuss that. First of all, we hear these words, not by works of righteousness, which we have done. It's not what we do. It's not you saying a certain prayer. It's not you giving a certain amount of money. It's not how much of the Bible you've read. And it's, it's not how well you sing. It's not what you do. And a lot of people, oh, they get angry with that. They just get frustrated. It's not about what I do. Because I want to do something. I want to earn my heaven. But not according to the Bible. It's not by works of righteousness, which we have done. Why is that? Well, because one day in eternity, God wants all the focus to be on his son. He doesn't want you to bring your trophies and awards to heaven. He doesn't want you to bring things that you've done to heaven. He wants everyone's focus to be on one person, his son. Besides that, it's not what I've done because what I've done has just made it possible for me to deserve anything but God's mercy. I ask my audience tonight, maybe just not a lot of people listening, but those who are, who would stand before God and say, give me what I deserve. Give me what I deserve. Who would ever do that? I would never do that in the court of law. I would never even go before a judge and I'd say, give me what I deserve. No. If ever you can be shown mercy, you ask for it. And why not from the God of heaven? Not because of what I've done. Not because of what I deserve. God shows mercy here. It's, it's a tremendous truth. Every soul has to fear judgment one day. To be judged by what I'm going to do. Some people fear it now. Some people think lightning's going to strike them. Uh, uh, an accident's going to happen. They think God's going to judge them. But not so. God says judgment will come one day. But you know what's great? The book of James, you go through your Bible and you go to the book of James chapter two and verse 13. And it tells me this, it says, mercy triumphs over judgment. Mercy, it, it, it crushes judgment. If you ever fear judgment one day, mercy is one of the greatest and sweetest truths that you could hear from scripture, from the lips of, the, from the lips of God, that God would have mercy and not judgment. That he would have mercy on those who are sinners, those who deserve his judgment, those who deserve his punishment. But instead, he, he doesn't give us what he deserves. You know, not only that, but the Bible says, who does receive mercy? Who does get it? Because our scripture here says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy. Well, who gets his mercy? When I turn to the Bible, it's often really pathetic people who get his mercy. In fact, if you were to go to the book of Luke, there's these three chapters right in a row. You can go from Luke 16 to 17 to 18. And in Luke 16, you get these men. There's all these men who have leprosy, and they're asking for mercy. In the next chapter, it's, it's a blind man who's asking for mercy. And, and then there's also a man who, who has nothing. He He's, he's, he's found in a church building, and he's just asking for mercy because he knows he has nothing to offer. You say, such pathetic people, such pathetic people. They have, they have nothing better to ask for. That's the problem with a lot of us is we have too much pride, too much pride. 
You look at individuals sometimes and you say, they've got nothing, nothing to lose. Of course, they would ask God for mercy. They've, they're, they're horrendous. So they're, they're, they're ailments. They're, they're eyesores to society. Every single human being who ever lived. You say each one of us, each one of us is a pathetic case when it comes to God's standard. We don't judge ourselves by our neighbor. We judge ourselves by Jesus Christ, and we've all fallen short. We've all fallen so terribly short. And would to God you would ask for his mercy, his mercy that is extended to us, that we are sinners. We are the ones who need this. We are the ones who desire to have mercy. Why is it? Well, simply because of this, because at Calvary, at Calvary, it was Jesus Christ who bore our punishment. It was him who didn't get mercy in order that God could extend his mercy towards us. We are looking for this. If you've ever thought that this was just something of dreams, well, the scriptures tell us here, there was even a man who said, God, be merciful. He said, to me, a sinner, to me, a sinner. He, he, he emphasized the individuals who receive this mercy because in the Bible, there's also another man He's one of the only men or one of the only stories that we have in scripture of a man who ends up in destruction, ends up in the place called hell, and he asks for mercy. And there's no mercy shown. You say, why is that? Why is it? Well, because the Bible tells me, the Bible tells me in the gospels that the Lord Jesus Christ has power on earth to forgive sins. He has power on earth to show mercy, but mercy is something for now. You don't pray for people's mercy after they're gone. Now. And so God be merciful to me, a sinner. One of the great pleas of the scripture. But not only that, not only why we need it, because we can't do anything. And not only who is shown towards people who are sinners, people who have nothing to offer God. The, the hymn writer says, we, we come with empty hands, empty hands, nothing to offer. And God has everything to give us. We get exactly what we don't deserve. And Matt's going to tell us about that in grace. But thank God he holds back what we do deserve. He doesn't give it to us. No judgment, no condemnation, no punishment. You say, where does it all go? Where does all that judgment, condemnation, and punishment, does God just, does God just cook the books? Does he just, does he just somehow take away? Does he, does he lock it up somewhere? No. The reason God's able to extend mercy the Bible tells us is because of his son, Jesus Christ, who endured all the punishment that I deserved, he took it. It was all placed on him. In fact, when you read in the Psalms, if you go to Psalm 51, the Bible tells us that God extends mercy according to his unfailing love, that mercy is shown because of the love of God. That is something that you almost could have guaranteed because God does everything because of his love. God is love. God is merciful. And these two thoughts come together at Calvary and all the punishment. Every time you think of what Christ endured for six hours at Calvary, you realize right away that was what I deserve. It was withheld from me and it was placed on his son because God loved me. And so when I look at Calvary, I realize here there was a place where mercy, mercy comes from that place. But when I look at Jesus Christ, he got no mercy. And grace comes from Calvary. But when I look at Calvary, I see a man, the Bible told me he died because of the grace of God, but never was grace shown to him at Calvary. And yet tonight, you could know the mercy of God, not getting what you deserve, and instead getting what you don't deserve. That's grace not getting the punishment, and getting God's goodness. That's a tremendous offer tonight. It's his mercy offered to you because of his son. You could have that tonight. Think of what our verse has said, so simple, that it was according to his mercy. It was his mercy, not because of works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy. Don't forget these words. He saved us. Nobody saves themselves. You don't use the word saved. You say, I helped myself. I, I, I gave myself a pat on the back. But the Bible says, 
he saved us. Tonight, you could know salvation because you could believe what the Bible says. It's not what you've done. It's what Christ has done. You could believe that. There's a guarantee right in that verse. He saves. God saves. Your parents don't save. Pastors don't save. Priests don't save. I, I can't save you. But God can. Why? Because it's his mercy. It's his son. And for Christ, it was his cross. It was his death. It could be your salvation. Because it's not what you've done. It's what Christ has done. It's his mercy. And he will save you tonight if you would believe that he died for you. He took your punishment. He bore it. He suffered the just for the unjust that he might bring us to God. Next time you hear the word mercy, you might hear it and you might say, sounds close to the definition. But remember this, there's no mercy like God's mercy. And tonight we've read about it in the Bible. It's according to his mercy, he saved us. Remember that tonight, believe that tonight, and you could be saved. Continue to listen to Matt as he tells us about just the opposite side of that coin. Not only not getting what we deserve, but getting what we don't deserve in the grace of God and seeing how tremendous that is. Continue to listen as he tells us about this tremendous grace. Thanks, Dave. We're going to read uh, just one verse tonight, and I'm going to try to be as simple as I can on the word grace. It's found in the book of Romans in chapter 5 and verse 20. And it says these words, Romans 5 and verse 20, moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound and the focus tonight in these words, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Where sin was, grace did much more abound. Grace was always greater. We have said those words as we spoke in the gospel that we are saved uh, by grace, that we are saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. When we see this word grace, it's very difficult to speak about in the Bible. It's mentioned 159 times in the Bible. The word would be cherish or favor or blessing or kindness or undeserved divine influence on the heart. Grace of God is giving you and I the greatest tre treasure to those like you and I who are least deserving. Sometimes we say, oh, I was so gracious with him. And I gave him a gift when he didn't deserve it. Well, that's different than when grace is used in connection with a thrice holy Godhead. It takes on a more powerful meaning when we connect grace with God. Grace is God choosing to bless us rather than curse us as our sin deserves. Do you understand? We've fallen short of God's glory and God through his grace is trying to bless us when we didn't deserve it. It is his benevolence to the undeserving. An average man speaks about 16,000, for the fun fact of the day, just to make it fun, 16,000 words a day, 112,000 words a week, and nearly 6 million words a year. So if you think about that, it's really a lot of words. And if you were to scan the entire human vocabulary for the most beautiful word in the universe, some might say perhaps it's love. I'd, I'd agree with you that's a beautiful word in the universe, but I'm today going to choose grace. I would say grace and love are, are right there hand in hand because in a fallen world, that is populated, if you look across the neighborhoods and people you interact with, populated by selfishness, populated by people who are lost, populated by people who are fearful, fear of the unknown, populated by rebellious people. Grace is the one thing that every single human being on this planet needs to have in their life. God's grace is more powerful, is the most powerful force in the universe. And I say that because it'll transform you. It'll supernaturally, radically transform the causal core of who you are as a human being, and God will transform your heart. And he does that with grace. It is an overused word today in our church and also an underdefined word in our church today. So just with just a scratching the surface, just barely, barely scratching, we're going to just touch on it. Dave opened with mercy, different than grace. Mercy withholding punishment we don't deserve. Grace gives us blessing we don't deserve. You understand that. In mercy, God chooses to cancel our sin debt by sacrificing his son in our place. That is to the person that has come to trust in God, has come to trust in Christ. Titus says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, 
but according to his mercy, that word is used, he saved us. Christ saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. Corinthians remind us that he made him who knew no sin, this is Christ, to be sinned for us, that we might become the righteousness in him. But God goes even further when you're talking about grace. God goes further than mercy, and he applies these thoughts, grace to his enemies. Romans 5 tells us, for when we were enemies, we we're reconciled to God through the death of his son. Now, never forget that the death of his son, there's God, there's the mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. And when Christ hung on a cross, he could reconcile God to man through the death of his person. And he, the writer continues, Paul continues in, in Romans 5 and says, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. I tell you all these because you tonight could be the recipient of the grace of God and knowing your sins forgiven. He offers you and I forgiveness. Hebrews tells us that. I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities. I will remember it no more. God offers that to you and to I through grace. And that is displayed and conquered and demonstrated and commended to you and I on an old rugged cross through the person of Christ. He provides reconciliation. Think of the generosities of grace. They're fueled by God. It pleased the Father, Colossians says, that in him all the fullness would dwell and by him to reconcile all things to himself by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made me peace through the blood of his cross. He gives you and I abundant life. Dave spoke on it just the other night. I am come, Jesus says, that they might have life and life more abundantly. Grace shows us that you and I don't deserve that. It's enough. I, I, hard to even say it this way, but we are saved. But God says, I want to not only save your life, I want to not only promise you a home in heaven, but I want to, on this earth, in time, prepare you for eternity and change your life. And that is the grace of God. He gives us eternal treasures. Luke tells us about treasures being stored in heaven, a place that never fails, a place where no thief can approach it or no moth can corrupt it. Eternal treasures, God's grace being bestowed upon men. He fills men when men come to trust in Christ. He fills them with the Holy Spirit. Luke 11 says, how much more will your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? He also gives you, if you came to trust Christ today, you came to understand that he paid for your sins. He took the burden, the regret, the penalty of your sins in the past, all your sins in the future, all your sins in the present today, and he bore them on his body on a cross. You can understand a home in heaven. Jesus says, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I never would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. It's a promise from the very Christ, from the very Godhead, God the Father, God the Son. Listen to John chapter 1 and verse 17. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, we see grace as well. Think about Noah's day. Wickedness, evil, same as today. I'd say today is worse. But God chooses to provide an ark for Noah's family to be safe. That, my friend, is grace. Never deserving it, God gives them an ark for them to have safety. God could have judged the world and rained fire on the world. But he gives Noah a way out. That is grace. Abraham and Sarah, when Abraham lies about Sarah being his sister. Think about Sarah laughing at God when God says, I will give you a child. And she says, God, I'm too old. And she laughs. Both marked by disbelief. Both marked by disobedience. But God fulfills the promise in Isaac. Grace. Think about Joseph, a, a, a boy that would have been brought up, not the way that boys are brought up today. I'm, I'm shocked when I talk to my, my son, my oldest especially, and the friends that he has with all the fancy sneakers and the cars and the toys and the big homes. Jo Joseph's actually sold into slavery. He's despised by his brothers. He's wrongfully accused. He's left to rot in prison. And yet Joseph's perspective through the grace of God, giving that to Joseph is this in Genesis 45. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve you, for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by being a great deliverance. Think about the grace of God. He gave that to Joseph. David, a man who lied, a man who stole. Maybe there's someone on the call today and you're saying, well, that's just like me. I lie. I have stolen. Perhaps not physically, but in your heart, you've coveted, you've taken things that are not yours. You have fornicated, you've lusted and killed. This is David. And yet, and God says that in his heart, he loves David. 
God's continually forgiving David. Notice Psalms, the grace of God. Think of grace as you even back up and you go into the Old Testament and you look right at creation. Just contemplate it just for a moment. God creates the heavens. He creates the earth. That's for you and for me. And there's darkness. And God says in his grace, let there be light. He divides the light from darkness. Grace for you and I to enjoy the pleasures of this world, to enjoy his creation. There's land between waters. There's dry land that appears. There's grass. There's herb yielding seed. There's fruit trees. He puts lights in the firmament of the skies, stars, planets, grace. He provides waters that have creatures, winged birds, cattle, everything creeping on the earth, grace. Then God says, as if that wasn't enough. Interesting, it wasn't for Adam and Eve because Adam and Eve needed a little bit more. But God says this, let us the Godhead, make man in our own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And it doesn't stop there. Notice what God says. To the humans, he gives instructions. You be fruitful and you multiply. You fill the earth and you subdue it. Dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over every living thing that moves on the earth. You say, Matt, why do you tell me this? Because that, my friend, is God's grace. He gives us things we did not deserve. He has given us families that we did not deserve. He gives us beautiful children that are healthy that he didn't, we didn't deserve. He gives us jobs that we don't deserve. He gives us homes that we don't deserve. He gives us grace upon grace. He saves us from disasters that we've never seen coming and will never know this, this side of eternity. He allows us even to get into challenging times just to get closer to him. Grace. You know, we're in this gospel series. This is grace. I, I don't deserve to be here. We never deserve as human beings to see people reached and saved and added to the kingdom of God and people that have come to trust Christ, left darkness and entered light. We don't deserve to do that or be part of that, but it's grace. We don't deserve a second of that. So one might say, okay, man, listen, I get grace is freely given love. I get its forgiveness. I get its acceptance. I get its help from God. I know that I can't earn it. I just want to understand what grace kind of looks like. Well, let me just tell you about six ways that God shows us grace. I'll do that in probably two and a half minutes. I'm going to be very short, very macro level. God shows you and I grace in this dispensation through forgiveness. If a person comes to the God of heaven the way you are, knowing that their sin has kept us guilty, God says forgiven through the person of Christ. Guilty people need to be judged for their sin. God says, I have sent him not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. God shows us grace in forgiveness. Christ went to a cross. So you and I could experience radical, comprehensive, and complete forgiveness of sins. Past sins, yes, I've mentioned it almost every night of the week. Present sins, yes, the sin you just committed five, ten minutes ago. Future sins, yes, the sins you'll commit later on this evening and tomorrow. They're forgiven. That is grace. You know, Hannah, my, my uh, daughter turns 10 tomorrow, and just today we were driving through the city of Phoenix, and uh, I said, hey, Hannah, it's a very special day. Your last day being nine is today. Tomorrow, you're going to go from single digits that you enjoyed for nine years of your life to double digits being 10, never to be in single digits again. And I'll tell you, she was so excited. She's not going to sleep all night. She can't wait for tomorrow. Can I tell you something that's more exciting than that? It's this, experiencing God's grace. Similar to the new birth. Think about when someone is born again. One is condemned by sin's penalty. They're under the burden of sin. They come to trust in the living Christ who died on an old rugged cross, and they become born again, never to be under sin's penalty, never to be under the burden of sin. But they're now they are in God's family. Christ is Lord, sin's forgiven, a home in heaven, all because of God's grace. Going from the single digits, if I can use that analogy, to double digits, never to touch single digits again. They're now part of God's family. God accepts people. If you came to him, the grace of God would accept you just the way you are regardless of your sins, regardless of the weight of your sin, regardless of how many sins you have done or how many sins you think you haven't done, the fact that we have fallen short of the glory of God, God says, him that comes to me, I will never cast out. You and I don't deserve to be accepted by God, but God promises to accept everyone from every part of the world. The presence of God abides with the believer, similar to acceptance, but God's presence means the Father is not distant. He's present with you everywhere you are when you come to trust Christ. The Bible says that God in his grace has made us in the place that he dwells. We are one with Christ. That is grace. 
He enables uh, believers. You know, there are sins that you perhaps struggled with, but when someone comes to a cross, God relieves that bondage. He, he frees the sinner and he starts to enable. He starts to help. The grace of God intervenes. It gives the human being power and strength. It gives us the ability to do what we're called to do, but what we could never do on our own. That is grace. Freedom. God delivering us from the addictions and slavery of sin. The Bible teaches this, that he who sins is a slave to sin. You might not realize sin like that. You might not understand sin like that. But God says we are in bondage in our sin. And the only way a sinner can be relieved of that bondage is when they come to Christ, the one who is victor over sin, death, hell, and the grave. And he did that all on a cross, completed in Christ. Amazing to know that when we get to heaven, we are fully complete, not to be bound by sin, to be sinless, not to be in bond, never to, in, to endure the bondage of sin or the misery of sin, complete in Christ. That's grace. Grace did much more abound. Where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. At Calvary, friend, when people mocked Christ, grace abounded. When spittle left the vile sinner's lips and it crossed that chasm where angels dwelt and it landed on the Savior, grace was there. When he was reviled, Christ, he reviled not. Grace was there. When he suffered, the Bible teaches, he threatened not. Jesus Christ, grace was there. When he was blindfolded and they ran around him and they said, you prophesy, you tell us who it is that smote you. And they began to hit the Savior. Grace was there. You say, Matt, why do you tell me that? Because Christ was fulfilling the Father's will and he would go to a cross and he would give man something they never deserved, salvation, eternal life, sins forgiven. When they created a crown that should have been a royal crown, but thorns, grace was there. When they smote him over the head with a reed, grace was there. When they opened his back, the Bible teaches, and it looked like a plowed field, they had beaten him so bad, grace was there. When they nailed his hands and they nailed his feet to a cross, grace was there. One might ask, isn't this all mercy, God holding back judgment? Yes, but it's also grace in that Jesus is providing salvation for man who never deserved it. What did we read? For when sin abounded, when your sin abounded, in all its wickedness, grace abounded much more. Now think about these words. I'm going to close with this quick little story. Driving through Phoenix today, I was frustrated. I was actually on an errand, and uh, I got the, uh, the noted to-do list. It was unexpected. I got a little text saying, can you please stop here? And I was a little frustrated. It's hard to actually uh, get me frustrated, but I, I was uh, today. Just there was a lot going on. And so the pedal perhaps in the truck was maybe a little closer to the floor than normal. Although I was following the speed limit, I was just taking turns and going really quick. But on the radio, this song came on and it really struck my heart about the grace of God. And the song is called My Story. You know, you could sing this song today. Understand who Christ is. Get a glimpse of his grace. It's the grace of God that even allowed that song to play on the radio today. I'm going to show you the words. Now listen to the words. If I told you my story, the writer says, you would hear hope that wouldn't let go. Can I tell you this? God won't let go. If I told you my story, the writer continues, you would hear love that would never get, give, give up. God's love will never give up on you. If I told you my story, the writer says, you would hear life, but it wasn't mine. Eternal life, the light of the world beckoning the sinner to come. The writer continues, if I should speak, then let it be of the grace that is greater than all my sin, of the justice that was served and where mercy wins, of the kindness of Jesus that draws me in. To tell you my story is to tell you of him. You meet someone, you say, what's your story? If they're saved, they usually take you right to a cross. They tell you, listen, my story is pretty boring, but let me tell you when Jesus Christ paid for my sins. And let me tell you the testimony of God's grace in my life. There was a day I was lost, and there was a day I was found. There was a day that I was blinded, and there's a day that I could see in my home is heaven for all of eternity. The writer continues, if I told you my story, you would hear victory over the enemy. If I told you my story, you would hear freedom that was won for me. That's through Christ. If I told you my story, you would hear life that overcame the grave. If I should then speak, let it be this. This is my story. This is my song. He continues, praising my Savior all the day long. You know what C.H. Spurgeon said? When God forgives our sins, listen carefully, Mr. Spurgeon, when God forgives our sins, there's more forgiveness to follow. He justifies us in the righteousness of Christ, but there's more to follow. He adopts us into his family, but there's more to follow. He prepares us for heaven, but there's more to follow. He gives us grace, 
but there's more to follow. He helps us to old age, but there's still more to follow. And even when we arrive in the world to come, in heaven, there will be still more to follow. Let those words grace upon your lips tonight. Come to trust Christ. Think of the writer. This is my story. You can walk away tonight saying this. This is my story, and this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Why? Because Jesus died for me.